Let's open our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 7, please. Jeremiah chapter 7. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray for your blessing upon it tonight. We pray that you would prepare our hearts to receive something that will be of eternal benefit to us. Do it, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Jeremiah the prophet was called of God to speak to the southern kingdom of Judah after the northern kingdom of Israel had already been called away into captivity. And when God told Jeremiah to speak to Judah, he did it in a time beginning with, which would seem to be a time of national revival under the King Josiah. And there were some good things that happened in Judah under Josiah, but it seems that much of the work that happened turned out to be superficial in its character. And so much of what God had Jeremiah the prophet do was confront this superficial faith, this superficial religion. And in confronting that superficial faith, now God told him to do something pretty dramatic, to stand at the temple gates and to cry out a sermon to the crowds who were coming in to worship at the temple. So can you just picture that seed in your mind? Picture Jeremiah. He, he's a relatively young man. I don't think this was at the very start of his ministry, but probably not too far along his 40-year career as a prophet. So a fairly young man standing near the gate of the temple, and as the thousands of people who come, many Bible scholars believe this must have happened at or near a feast time when many people were going up to the temple. It's, it's not proven in the text, but it would make sense if that were the case. And he's crying out to them, confronting them with the superficiality of their faith in the living God. Now, what's very interesting is in Jeremiah chapter 26, he also preaches a sermon at the gates. And what we don't exactly know is if that is a same sermon described here in chapter 7, or if it's a different sermon that he preached at the temple gates. My inclination is to think that it's a different sermon, but it might have been the same. The, the one that's recorded in Jeremiah chapter 26 is given a particular time marker. It's said to have happened in the first few years of the reign of Jehoiakim, the successor to Josiah. So I don't know exactly if this is the same sermon or just one repeated in the same place, but the theme grabs us. Do you see what the theme was? Look at it there in verse 4. Do not trust in these lying words saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. In other words, the mentality of the people in Judah and Jerusalem at that time was simply this. Hey, we're okay. We got the temple. God won't allow his temple to be destroyed. Oh, I find it fascinating they had such a carnal confidence in the temple, believing that because God had spared the temple before, and he had spared the temple before, more than a hundred years before this time, a mighty Assyrian army under the leadership of a general named Sennacherib came against Jerusalem and surrounded it and looked like he was about to destroy it. And God sent an avenging angel who in one night slayed a hundred thousand Assyrian soldiers. He miraculously delivered Jerusalem. So maybe they looked to the past. Maybe they looked to promises that said that God would set his name on his house and that God would protect it. They said, hey man, we're good. We're good. We got the temple. God will never allow his temple to be destroyed. And God said, no, don't go around saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Friends, I think this is a very challenging thing for us. Are we not tempted to put a, a trust in external things? Friends, I hope nobody goes around saying, I'm of Calvary Chapel, I'm of Calvary Chapel, I'm of Calvary Chapel. Thinking that that somehow makes you right with God? Uh, I'm an American, I'm an American, I'm an American. I'm of this political party, this political party, this political party. As if those things were to make you right with God? No. 
No. I think somebody would have more merit saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And God said, forget about it. Look at what he says there in verse 3. Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. I don't want you to say words. I want you to address your life. You've been in sin. You need to repent. And look at the real repentance that God looks for them to do. Verse 5. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place or walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Amend your ways. Now, once you notice the things that he listed for them to do in a real demonstration of repentance, execute judgment between a man and his neighbor. Do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. Don't shed innocent blood. And then the next one, the fourth one is, or walk after other gods to your hurt. Did you notice four of, excuse me, three of the four have to do with how you treat your fellow man? Only one of them was primarily religious in character, having to do with how you act towards God. Friends, God cares very much how we treat one another. You can almost find a corollary to this in 1 John. Where in 1 John, and I'll paraphrase some of the ideas from 1 John. You can read through the book and read it easily for yourself. But some of the ideas from 1 John run something like this. Don't say you love God when you hate your brother. Nobody can really say they love God and hate their brother at the same time. And sometimes we get this mentality going, don't we? Oh man, I really love the Lord. It's just all those people I can't stand. Well, friend, who do you think is going to be with you in heaven? All those people that you said you couldn't get along with on earth. You can be with them for all of eternity. Hopefully you're going to be with them for all of eternity. If the work of God is real in your life. And one of the demonstrations that the work of God is real in our life is that it just doesn't affect our vertical relationship with the Lord, though that is wonderful and even primary, but it has an effect on our horizontal relationships as well. Verse 11, or verse 8, rather. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, false, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. God's really laying it on him, isn't he? What are you doing, Judah? You run out and you commit all these horrible sins and crimes, and then you come back and you look to find refuge in the house of the Lord. Matter of fact, that phrase caught you when he says there in verse 11, has this house which is called by my name become a den of thieves in your eyes? You remember that, right? Because Jesus quoted that same line, for example, in Matthew chapter 21, verse 13. It's also in Mark and in Luke. But when Jesus spoke of the corruption of the temple service in his own days, he referred to the concept of a den of thieves. And you know what a den of thieves is? It's a place where the thieves go out and do their dirty work, but then they run back and find refuge at the den, and then they go back out again. They were doing the same thing in the temple. They would go out and commit their sins of the whole variety that you read there, but they would come back and find some kind of refuge in the ceremonialism of the temple. And God says, I don't want any of it. God says, verse 11, behold, I, even I have seen it. Friends, do you catch that? A den of thieves is supposed to be a hideout. It's supposed to be a play where you're hidden from the law. But what does God say? I got my eyes on you. I see it. You're not escaping my justice. You're not escaping my sight. Verse 12, but go now to my place, which was in Shiloh, where I have set my name at the first and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now because you've done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear. And I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house which is called by my name in which you trust and to this place in which I gave you and your fathers as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast out all your brethren, the whole posterity of Ephraim. Friends, there's something very powerful there that he introduces in verse 12. Did you catch that? He says, go now to my place which was in Shiloh, where I set my name in at first. When the tabernacle of God, which housed the Ark of the Covenant, 
the tent that was sort of a portable temple, when that tent first found a resting place in the promised land, one of the first places it sat at for an extended period was a place called Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle was. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where the altar of the Lord was. And they said, hey, man, we're Shiloh. We're cool. We've got the altar. We've got the tabernacle. We've got the Ark of the Covenant. Because they trusted in all those things. God allowed Shiloh to be conquered by the Philistines. And they captured the Ark of the Covenant. Matter of fact, they killed the high priest, or the high priest died. They didn't directly kill him, but he died in the attack. And his two sons as well. And then later on, Shiloh was conquered again by the Assyrians when they came and conquered. Oh, you think, Jerusalem, you're such a favored place because you have the Ark of the Covenant and God did such a great work there before. No, no, no. Look at what happened to Shiloh when they forgot about that. It's gone and you're going to be gone too if you don't repent. Friends, sometimes there's a danger And let me speak to you just very heart to heart, a pastor to his congregation. Sometimes there is a danger being in a place where God has moved mightily. The presence of the Lord was at Shiloh. The presence of the Lord was at Jerusalem. And what did they do? They had a carnal trust in those things and they thought man we're good we got the ark of the covenant we got the uh, altar we're good we're the house of the lord friends that happens by analogy among churches today when they have a confidence in what god did in the past they say hey we must be good look at all the great things god has done through our congregation and they trust in some prior standing with god instead of where they are at right now with the lord You go look at Shiloh, and what is it? It's desolate. Friends, and I could say it today, you go look at Jerusalem right now and up on that temple mount, it's desolate. That temple's gone. The Ark of the Covenant is no longer there. The judgment came to Jerusalem, the judgment came to Shiloh, and the judgment will come to any place where God is forgotten because they were so confident about what God did in the past. Does it make you sad sometimes when you're in a city? I've experienced this a lot in Europe. And there's this amazing church. And you think, man, people worked maybe for hundreds of years to build this building to the glory of God. And there is not a word of the living God preached in that building anymore. That's like a Shiloh. The place still stands, but it's devoid of the presence of God. Friends, that can happen, and it must be energetically avoided. The lesson must be sealed in our hearts. No much how much spiritual progress we've had or privilege in the past or glory that might be among a people. It can all be turned to nothing if we stop listening to God and cultivating our own relationship with him. Going on now, verse 16. Talk about heavy. How about this? Therefore, do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession for me. For, or excuse me, intercession to me, for I will not hear you. Do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods so they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? It's as if God says, listen, don't pray for them, Jeremiah. They're so far gone. Do you want an example of how far gone they are? Their idolatry is a whole family affair. Did you see those words in verse 18? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead the dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. For Ishtar, the Babylonian moon goddess, or Venus, as she was popularly known, For Ashtoreth, or the other variants of the same Venus goddess that ruled over so much of the mentality of that part of the world at that time. Oh, and they make it a family affair. The children gather sticks, the father makes the fire, the mama rolls the dough, and they stamp it all out, just like they're making Christmas things. Oh, look, our little cakes to the goddess of heaven. They've made their idolatry a family affair. Instead of gathering around and coming to meet the Lord together as a family in prayer or a bit of the word, no, they gather together and they make their idolatry a family affair. 
What does this do? It provokes themselves, verse 19, to the shame of their own faces. Now, it was true that it provoked the Lord to anger, but it was also true that their sins provoked themselves to open shame. And so this is what God says in verse 20. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, my anger and my fury will be poured out on this place, on man and on beast, on the trees of the field and on the fruit of the ground, and it will burn and not be quenched. You can't provoke the Lord forever without getting a response. Friends, one of the things I want you to see is it's easy to read the book of Jeremiah. Come on, let's be honest here. It's easy to to read the book of Jeremiah. God, man, why are you so upset? Don't you just seem to lay it on pretty thick? Man, why don't you just chill out a little bit, God? I thought you loved these people. I thought you were nice. Listen, this needs to be put in the context of God's merciful warnings to them for decades upon decades. And to remember that the judgment that he announced did not come for perhaps at this time, maybe 30 or 25 years after God had announced it. God gave them so much time to repent, so much time to amend their ways. But friends, we mistake the mercy of God for softness against sin. Because God does not bring judgment immediately, we think he's never going to bring it at all. Now, if God were to bring judgment immediately in each case, we'd say, oh God, why don't you be more merciful? But because he's merciful, we go, ah, he doesn't care much about sin. But friends, God does care about sin. And he cannot be provoked forever without a response. But please don't take the mercy of God to mean softness against sin. That's not how God is. He's giving you and me and each one of us time to amend our ways. Verse 21. Thus says the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat meat. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices, but this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in all the ways that I have commanded you that it may be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear but followed the counsels and the dictates of their evil hearts and went backwards, not forward. Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have sent even to you all my servants, the prophets, daily, rising up early and sending them. Yet they did not obey me or incline the ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. You see, in the mentality of the people of Judah and Jerusalem at the time, they said, oh, 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 so we're in sin. Okay, no, no problem, God, we're in sin. We'll bring a sacrifice. You know what God says? He goes, I don't want your stinking sacrifices. Matter of fact, notice what he says there in verse 21. Add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat meat. The burnt offering was to be wholly burnt before God. Now, many of the other offerings, a portion of the animal was given as meat to either the sacrifice or the priest. God says, you guys are so insincere, so superficial about these sacrifices you bring. You know the burnt offering? Why don't you just go ahead and eat a bit of it? I don't care. You're not bringing it sincerely anyway. Matter of fact, God goes on to say, look at it there in verse 22, for I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. Did you ever consider that when God gave the nation of Israel the law of God, the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, there's not a word about sacrifice or offering in the Ten Commandments. That only came later. God said, no, no, no. Before I ever spoke a word to my people about the priesthood or sacrifice, I called them to obey. And God says, I meant something very deliberately by that order. Yes, there's a place for sacrifice. Yes, it's God's ordained way of dealing with the sin problem. But what God once addressed first is the issue of obedience. Now, friends, can you imagine an ancient Israelite? Yeah, I sin. Yeah, I do this. But it's a, no problem, man. I got a burnt offering that'll cover that. Now, And I know this is hard. But are there not believers who say, yeah, I sin, but Jesus forgives? I'm trusting in the Lord, man. No, but your low view of sin is actually a very low view of Jesus and his holiness. And God wants to shake you up now and say, yeah, you're hiding things in the shadow of the cross. God wants you to have a greater concern for obedience. 
I mean, don't you have any concern for obedience in your life? We just say, oh, the cross, the cross, the cross. This was the problem with Israel in those days. But their problem, verse 24, they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsel and the dictates of their evil hearts. But that's today. He's speaking to the modern age right there. Listen, what, what is one of the dominant themes of every television show, of every movie that Hollywood produces? How about this? Follow your heart. And friends, let me tell you. Let me read verse 24 to you again. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsel and the dictates of their evil hearts. Friends, that's what following your corrupt heart will get you. How about this? Follow the Lord. Concern yourself less with following your heart and a little bit more with following Jesus. And you know what? You're going to be happier. I can guarantee you that. Now, you, your life may not be as easy in some ways. You will introduce difficulties in your life by following the Lord first. I guarantee it. But you will have something from God that cannot be replaced by anything in this world. No, you really want to find joy and peace and happiness in this world? Forget about following your heart and dedicate yourself to following Jesus. Now, verse 27 This is a a great uh, verse for preachers to memorize, a a lifetime memory verse for a preacher here. Therefore, you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not obey you. You shall also call to them, but they will not answer you. (laughs) Jeremiah says, thank you, Lord, for this ministry you've given me. Friends, can you imagine what a difficult ministry Jeremiah had? There he is preaching at the temple. Now, he's preaching at the temple gate, these words. And people are like, what? What? Why are you saying this? You're putting down sacrifice here? A guy comes up with a sheep to come and sacrifice to the Lord. And Jeremiah is screaming at him about the the, the falseness of their sacrificial system. And don't say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Right there at the temple gate, he's saying this. And I imagine that verse 27 was almost a word that God spoke personally to Jeremiah's heart. Jeremiah, none of them are listening to you, but don't worry. I want you to speak it. Nevertheless, I know they're not listening to you. I know the angry look that they have in their eye, but you be faithful in what I've given you to do. But his sermon didn't end. Verse 28, so you shall say to them. Again, just picture Jeremiah at the temple gate shouting this out. This is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord their God, nor receive correction. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. Cut off your hair and cast it away, and take up a lamentation on the desolate heights, for the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to pollute it. And they built the high places of Tophet, which is called, excuse me, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart. Oh, now he's really laying it on him. Now he cries out to the crowd again, and he says, verse 29, the Lord has rejected and forsaken this generation of his wrath. You don't obey the voice of the Lord. You don't receive correction. Truth has perished from among you. And they have even, look at it in verse 30, they have set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it. Friends, abominations there, the idea in the ancient Hebrew is idolatry. They were setting up idolatry at the temple itself. Now, I don't believe that they put it in the holy place or the most holy place, but probably in some side room. You know, the temple was a whole complex of rooms. And somewhere off to the side somewhere, they had abominations. They had idol, idolatry and idols set up. Think of what it would be like. There you are, you're visiting a church. And wow, nice church. You know, boy, the sanctuary, Sunday school room. You go into another room, and there's an adult bookstore right there. How profane. That's the idea. You go to another room in the church, there's a Buddhist shrine there in the church. What? Oh, they say, oh, no, no, it's not in the sanctuary. No, we would never have it in the sanctuary. No, no, it's off to the side. You say, well, what are you talking about? This whole area should be dedicated to God. 
but they had allowed those kind of abominations in God's house. And if it could get worse, it does. Look at verse 31. They have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. Worse yet, in the valley of Hinnom, at a place called Tophet. Now, Tophet may be a symbolic name because it comes from the Hebrew word for fireplace. So it was a place of burning, a place of fire. At this place called Tophet in the valley of the son of Hinnom, where the valley of Hinnom was a place where they sacrificed their sons and daughters to the pagan god. You should know that among archaeologists and scholars, there is debate as to how much child sacrifice was practiced by these ancient cultures. Some of them say not that much. Some of them say it was only done in the worst kind of extremities and in the worst kind of crises they would offer a child. I tend to think it was more than that because when I read of not one but two kings of ancient Israel who offered their children to the god Molech, And if the kings are doing it, then you better believe the people are doing it. I don't know how common it was, but I think it was more than just a rare occasion when they would come and send their children to the fire. Newborn, alive babies burnt up. Friends, this displeases God so much. Don't you believe the children are precious to the Lord? Don't you believe that God honors the life of those little ones? And when they would subject these little ones to such a horrible doom, there it says, in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that's where they perform these abominations. And God says in verse 31, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart. Matter of fact, I think that one of the purposes in Genesis chapter 22 with the whole story of God commanding Abraham to go and sacrifice Isaac, but then very demonstrably and pointedly stopping him, the reason God did that was to show, I do not want human sacrifice. Abraham, I am stopping you. I am not like the Canaanite gods. I am not like those monstrosities. I will not allow it. Do not sacrifice your children unto me. I do not want human sacrifice. God says, this isn't me. I cannot go on to verse 32 without saying at least a word about this. You know that by analogy, we can say that child sacrifice has not ended in our own culture. That many, many children perish in our own culture. And they perish still in the womb. Now, this is a difficult thing to bring up. Not because I'm ambivalent about it. Because the last thing I want to do is heap guilt upon already broken hearts for what they may have done in the past. But I say it as a plea. Because, friends, do you know that it's Christian young women who are often ending their pregnancies. And one of the reasons why they often do it is because they feel they cannot stand the embarrassment in the church. I don't know how we change that, but we've got to do everything we can to change that and to tell young women who may find themselves in that situation, do not sacrifice your child. Do not let a sense of shame or embarrassment lead you to do something that you will regret for the rest of your life. Look at what God says was going to come upon Israel for what they did. Verse 32. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when it will no more be called Tophet or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter, for they will bury in Tophet until there is no room. The corpses of this people will be food for the birds of the heavens and for the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. And then I will cause to cease from the cities of Judah, from the streets of Jerusalem, to the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall be desolate." 
Listen, Jerusalem, Judah, the prophet Jeremiah says, you're having a pretty good time right now. And maybe even the sacrifice of your children is accompanied by a ceremonial festive meal or this thing or that deal. Let me tell you something, Jerusalem and Judah, the prophet Jeremiah would say, the party's going to be over. And God will very fittingly stack up the corpses of the slaughtered dead when the Babylonians come and evade. And they'll be stacked up in that valley where you once sacrificed your children. You want to know how bad it'll be? They won't even be buried. And scavengers and birds will eat them. Which, by the way, that's repulsive to anybody. It was especially repulsive to the ancient Near Eastern mind. There was actually a disgrace worse than just being killed. It was being killed and having your body eaten by scavengers. It was the utter, most extreme disgrace a person could think of. And God says, that's on the way. Continuing on into verse 1 of Jeremiah chapter 8. At that time, says the Lord... They shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of its princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of the graves. They shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven which they have loved and which they've served and after which they've walked, which they have sought and which they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. <laughs> you see, not only will there be the bodies of the slaughtered dead, which is grotesque enough, but then these invaders will go and they'll break open the tombs, either to be grave robbers or just to desecrate the bones of their ancestors. And they'll take them and they'll spread them out before the sky and they'll say, here are the bones of your exalted ancestors. And there was this strange congruity. There was a strange appropriateness where the bones of these people who had worshipped Venus are now lying out open before the sky with no dignity, no burial. Verse 3, Then death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of those who remain of this evil family, who remain in all the places where I have driven them, says the Lord of hosts. This is an interesting reference in verse 3. It has reference to those who survived the Babylonian invasion and will be carried away captive as forced refugees, as exiles from the land of Judah into the land of Babylon, and these people will wish they were dead. That's how agonizing it's going to be for those people who are carried off by force. And look at their, 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 their stubborn folly beginning in verse 4. Moreover, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, will they fall and not rise? Will one turn away and not return? Why is this people slidden back? Jerusalem in a perpetual backsliding. They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I listened and heard, but they do not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. Even the stork in the heavens knows where appointed times. And the turtle dove, the swift, and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. He, he brings such amazing logic to the argument. I love the prophet Jeremiah. Look at what he says in verse 4. He says, uh, will they fall and not rise? Will one turn away and not return? Remember that old commercial, I've fallen and I can't get up? <laughs> well, that, that's what God's saying. Oh, a guy fell down, and you walk by and he's still on the ground. Oh, what you doing? Oh, I don't know. I just thought I'd stay down here. Well, once you get up, no, I won't get up. Or, or you're walking on the wrong way. You go, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Well, I'll just keep going. Why don't you turn? Oh, I'll just keep going. Dude, how crazy is that? You've fallen, but you won't get up. You're on the wrong road, but you won't turn around. God says that spiritually is the condition of my people. How spiritually insane can people be? Even as he says in verse 6, everyone has turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. They were so determined to go their own way and so energetic, they were like a horse rushing into the battle as fast as they could go. That's how determined they were to go in the wrong way. And then he goes, this is so stupid. Look at verse 7. Even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times. He lists all these migratory birds. The stork, the swift, the swallow. Hey, bird brain. <laughs> the, st the, the migratory birds know when to go, where to go, how to go, and when to come back. You don't know a thing. The birds are smarter than you. And yet you don't consider 
that the Lord should be returned unto. Verse 8, how can you say, we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Look, the false pen of the scribes certainly works falsehood. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? Friends, I think we should make a bumper sticker out of verse 9. How about that? Isn't that a great statement? They have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? I think you could look at just about any problem of the world today and write that over it. There's man's folly trying to get things done. There's man's attempt trying to fix things, through politics, through this, through that, smart, whatever. You just write all over it. They've rejected the word of the Lord. What wisdom do they have? You're going nowhere, Judah. And then verse 10, therefore, this is the judgment that's going to come upon those who reject the word of the Lord. Therefore, I will give their wives to others and their fields to those who will inherit them because from the least even to the greatest, everyone is given to covetousness. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely for they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abominations? No, they were not at all ashamed. Nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall in the time of their punishment. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. I will surely consume them, says the Lord. No grapes shall be on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaves shall fade, and the things I have given them shall pass from them. If some of this sounds familiar... There's a few verses there that are repetitions from Jeremiah chapter 6, verses 13, 14, and 15. Do you see why God's repeating the same things to them? Because they are not listening. Verse 14. Why do we sit still? Assemble yourselves, and let us enter the fortified cities, and let us be silent there. For the Lord our God has put us to silence and given us the water of gall to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. Friends, I think that's a very interesting line in verse 14. It seems to be in the voice of those who are anticipating the coming Babylonian invasion. What do they say in verse 14? Let us enter the fortified cities and let us be silent there. Oh, now the Babylonians have come. Now we see our doom coming. Let's escape. We'll go into a fortified city and maybe we can wait out the invasion. But look at what happens in verse 15. We looked for peace, but no good came. And for a time of health, and there was trouble. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones. For they have come and devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in it. For behold, I will send serpents among you, vipers which cannot be charmed, and they shall bite you, says the Lord. You can escape into your fortified cities all you want. You're not going to escape this judgment that is to come. Now verse 18 begins a section where I think he has in mind Judah after the Babylonian invasion. Judah in exile. Listen to what Jeremiah says. I would comfort myself in sorrow. My heart is faint within me. Listen, the voice, the cry of the daughter of my people from a far country, from the place where they've been exiled. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images with foreign idols? You see, it's as if Jeremiah, he sees and he mourns because he sees his people in a distant land, in a far place. And from that distant land, the people cry out, where's the Lord? Is the Lord in Zion? And God answers back to them, why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images and their foreign idols? You guys loved your foreign idols so much, I sent you to a foreign land. And now all you do is long for Zion once again. Now for the last couple verses of chapter 8, friends, these are some of the most mournful verses that you'll find in a very mournful book. Verse 20, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Most scholars believe that when it refers to the harvest, it's talking about the earlier grain harvest that would happen like at the beginning of springtime or the beginning of summer. Then in late summer, autumn, you would have the harvest that would come from the vines, fruit, and all of that. 
So it's like, well, the first harvest failed, and then summer came, and there was nothing on the vine. We are finished. Think of what it would be like to be a farmer. You're living off the land. The first harvest fails, the first harvest of the year. You go, it's okay, we got a second harvest of the year. It's going to be tight, but we can get by. And then the second harvest comes, there's nothing. We are not saved. This was probably a proverbial expression in ancient Israel for utter despair and hopelessness. Now verses 21 and 22. This is Jeremiah. I think Jeremiah is telling us how he feels about all this. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. I am mourning. Astonishment has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? Friends, I pray that our culture has a true repentance before judgment from the Lord comes. And and I am hopeful. I do. I have hope of it. I have hope. I see stirrings of a great work of God. And I am hopeful that there will be a great revival, a great awakening among God's people and in the culture at large. But let me say this. If there should not be, and if judgment should come in some way to our culture, in a greater measure than we've already seen, I hope that we will have the heart of Jeremiah in the midst of it. I hope that we won't be hurtful Christians with folded arms saying, told you so. Told you so. Isn't it far more important to have a broken heart over it all, like Jeremiah? To have a broken heart that says, for the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. This is like a knife in my own soul. Because I, want, I don't want to be right. I want people to repent. I don't care about being right in that sense. I care about hearts turned to the living God. Friends, Jeremiah despaired because he said, is there no balm in Gilead? Gilead was known for a balm. They don't know exactly what it was like, but it was some soothing lotion. A lot of people think it might have been something like aloe vera. It was used to treat wounds and help healing. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there nothing that can help? Is there no physician? You want to know something? We have a categorical answer to Jeremiah's question, do we not? Do we not have a much better message to bring to our culture and to needy people all around us? You better believe there's a balm in Gilead. It's called the blood of Jesus. You better believe there's a physician. It's Jesus, the great physician. Because if you need the remedy from where the corruption of your heart has led you when you followed your heart. Friends, there's a medicine in the sacrifice of Jesus on your behalf and there is a great physician who knows exactly how to apply it. This is the message we need to bring to our world that will help avert judgment that, let's be honest, we deserve. But God is rich in mercy. And I pray that there will yet be a great turning to the Lord, both among his people and in the culture at large, that will forestall the judgment and bring great honor and glory to God. It'll happen by receiving that balm of Gilead and receiving the work of the great physician. 